Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today to our, our April STEM Spiration talk. My name is Leslie Simmons, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at CTE Foundation, and I um, manage our Community WISE initiative, and WISE stands for Women Investing in STEM Equity. And today I'm really thrilled to welcome Amani Weber Schultz for our STEM Spiration speaker series. Uh, I saw Amani on a, um, a panel discussion. I don't know if it was earlier this year or last year sometime. Um, and she really, you know, I really just adored her energy and exuberance about sharks and learning. And I was really excited to hear about uh, an organization that she's formed called MISS, which stands for Minorities in Shark Sciences. It's a nonprofit in the, in the works, uh, and it's all about increasing diversity in shark sciences. Um, Amani, I'm going to welcome you. I'm going to ask you to come on screen so everybody can see you. And uh, so Amani graduated Rutgers University last year with a Bachelor's of Science in Marine Science and a minor in Fishery Science. Um, she from what I can tell, didn't really pursue shark science until she actually received a scholarship from field school and um, got to get out on the boat and had the opportunity to really explore marine sciences hands on, which is what CTE Foundation is all about, is really bringing hands on experiences for students. Um, originally from the Bay Area, Amani is currently living on the East Coast and is, I think, still deciding between grad schools. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, still deciding. It's a hard decision. <laughs> yeah. So before we get going, um, I want to have a quick rapid fire question period with you so we can get, get to know you. So don't think too hard about these questions. Hopefully it's nothing too challenging. Uh, just kind of want to loosen this up and have some fun. So the first really important question, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? mint chocolate chip okay morning People say it or... tastes like toothpaste i don't mm -hmm. agree i don't are agree you... <laughs> i like it with good chocolate chips yes <laughs> um so are you a morning or night person night person do not wake me up before like 9 30. <laughs> what let's see who is your favorite superhero or heroine um oh goodness i think it's i think it's spider-man I yeah, I'm gonna go with Spider Man. I'm gonna stick with my guts and go with Spider Man. <laughs> there's no shark like superhero yet. Is there like not. there's Aquaman? <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, okay, what's the first concert you ever attended? Uh, Madonna. Madonna. Oh, wow. And what's yeah. the last concert you attended? Janet Jackson. Hmm. You must be an '80s kid, right? I went with my mom to both of those. <laughs> I actually saw Madonna in concert too. I don't remember which, uh, it was probably around the year 2000. So I saw yeah. her, yeah. I saw her at Oracle in Oakland. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, what was your first job? Um, I was a hostess at a restaurant in Berkeley. Customer service, it's very yep. important. <laughs> uh, how about what's your most used emoji? Oh, the shark emoji. I feel like that's a given, but it's I use the shark emoji too often. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Uh, so here's a good one. If someone were to play you in a movie, who would it be? I don't know a specific person. I feel like I'd have to go with like my best friend because she knows exactly how I am and I think she could play me pretty well since she knows my personality. So she wouldn't really have to act that hard. No, I don't think so. Although I think she would make it like she'd kind of go all in and probably be more sarcastic than I am <laughs> and over the top. Fun. Um, what is your hidden talent? Um, I'm really good at rock climbing because uh, that's just like a hobby of mine. And so I've gotten pretty good at that. Um, I'm also decent at art when I really want to be, I've discovered, like digital art is something that I kind of just picked up during COVID and now I'm decently good at it. <laughs> okay, art, I love that. Um, I don't know if I could just magically become a good artist, I feel so inept at that, but that's awesome. I think it's great that that's a new hobby for you. Uh, okay, so this is a tough one. Finish this sentence, I want you to say, when I dance, I look like... Squidward. <laughs> That's the first thing that popped into my mind is Squidward from SpongeBob. 
<laughs> awesome. I'll have to look at some uh, SpongeBob episodes. To there's see what a that gif. Like. There's like, like a gif of Squidward dancing, and he's going like this, and that's the one that I thought of. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So speaking of Squidward and also art, my last question is not a fire rapid fire question, but okay. in doing some research on you today, um, I came across how it pants. Oh yes. <laughs> so. Can you please just explain to our audience what the heck is how it pants? I'm going to actually put a um, link in the um, chat for people because this was cracking me up and bringing me a lot of joy just now. <laughs> so uh, go yeah. ahead and tell us so about it. Basically, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, during, oh, I accidentally opened something. Oh, okay. Never mind. Um, during quarantine, I decided to start putting pants on animals and like asking my twitter followers which way an animal would wear pants so like the first one that i drew was like a stereotypical shark like a great white shark um and i drew two different ways that it would wear pants and then posted it and i thought that it would just be like a one and done this is hilarious but then people started requesting animals from me um and i was really bored because i was stuck inside because this was still back in june when we were all like not really doing that much um and i just started doing it more and more and now it's just a thing that people <laughs> expect from me uh and people will like tag me in things on twitter of other things like someone tagged me in like how a cow would wear a tie or like a giraffe would wear a tie um or how something else would wear pants there's a there's a meme of a shark with a harmonica over its mouth and then over its gills and people always tag me in that and they're like how would a shark play a harmonica and to answer this question for everybody it would have to use it in its mouth and also in its gills to get the full range of sound because you can blow in and out of a harmonica and sharks can't blow out with their mouth so it would have to go out their gills like if water could play a harmonica i guess <laughs> i love it so yes everybody should definitely check that out i think it was really it was really fun and like i said giving me a lot of joy to look through some of those images and you are you are a talented artist i oh, would you. say like and you know some you know fish and marine animal uh, anatomy very well so thank you yeah that's been fun although some people i drew a squid with pants on and i did not draw it like anatomically correct and some people came after me and i had to apologize <laughs> oh my Goodness. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and let you get started with your presentation. I'm excited to hear more about what you've got to say. And uh, people, please ask questions. You can throw them in the Q&A or the chat. I'm going to jump over to Facebook too and monitor that. Make sure if, if people have questions, I'll, I'll post them for you here, Amani, or I'll jump in. Um, but really, let's just have a conversation and let you take it away. Yeah, if there's, I don't think I can see the chat while I'm sharing my screen. So feel free to interrupt me to ask a question if it has to do with that slide. Alrighty. I will share my screen now. Can you see that? Amazing. Okay, so this is me. I'm Amani. Um, I am a co-founder and chief financial officer of Minorities and Shark Sciences, as previously stated, and I also got my Bachelor's of Science in Marine Science from Rutgers University in New Jersey in May 2020. So I did graduate during the pandemic, which was super weird, but it's fine. I've moved on. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start with talking about when I first got in touch with the ocean um, and then go through like how I got to where I am and then talk about shark workups and give you all a rundown of what we do with sharks. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I, of course, grew up going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and that is my favorite aquarium. And this picture right here is me. I don't know, I was like two or three with my aunt um, in the aquarium. And fun fact, my parents actually lost me in the Monterey Bay Aquarium one time because I decided that I wanted to wander around by myself. Um, and they found me, I think, in the tunnel, just like staring up at fish and not really panicking and like being fine without my parents. Um, this next picture is when we went to the Galapagos Islands. Um, I was also three, this is 2002. Okay, so yeah, I was still three. Um, Cause my parents really liked traveling and this is actually my earliest ocean memory. Um, this picture right here is when we went and saw the massive tortoises that they have there. But my earliest memory is from Ecuador. And it's looking down over a fishing boat at my purple hat that blew off and is sinking into the ocean. Um, and just seeing all these beautiful fish, like the colors were amazing and vibrant and I was in awe. And that is something that has stuck in my mind. And now I'm 22 and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, this 
next two photos are from Fiji. This is the first time that I was up close with a wild shark. Um, these are white tip reef sharks. They don't actually get that big um, in the area that we were in, but it was super cool. And it's the first time that I swam with sharks and it was probably the moment that I decided I wanted to do marine science as a career. This was right before my senior year of high school. So right before I started applying to schools and figuring out what my major should be, where I wanted to go to school and things like that. So it was definitely a turning point for me because before that I'd been jumping around careers and I was like, I want to be a veterinarian and I want to be an aerospace engineer and I want to work for the CIA. Um, and I had all these crazy careers that I wanted to do. And like, thankfully I had this experience right before senior year where I was like marine science. I want to do marine science. So a little bit about my background. Um, as I said, I graduated from Rutgers in New Brunswick and I did marine science for all four years of my undergrad. I worked in a ton of different labs and took some really cool classes. So all of these pictures, I will explain them, but they're all different experiences that I've had. So for all four years of my undergrad, I worked in a paleoceanography lab, um, which is fossils. And the woman that I worked for also did geology. So she did a lot of dating things um, using rocks or using fossils. And she specifically looked at carbon um, isotopes. So this picture on the top left, those are forams. And basically they are single celled organisms that sit in the ocean. They can sit in the water column or they can sit on the ocean floor. And they create these amazing shells, which is what this picture is of, that is made of calcium carbonate. And one of the super cool things about calcium carbonate is as it grows, it collects the different nutrients that are in the water and can hold them. So she'll take these shells, um, do all this crazy chemistry to them, and then she can see different carbon isotopes. And depending on what the carbon isotopes are, um, she can see what the weather was millions of years ago, which is super cool. Um, the oldest ones that we did, I think were from 2.5 million years ago, which is crazy. Um, and it was really cool to just be like, I'm looking at something that was alive 2 million years ago. This is insane. Um, and the way that she would get these is they sit, they sink when they die. Um, and the way that time records go back in soil is the top of the soil is the earliest time. And as you go down, you go back in time. And so she would go to New Zealand. She would take these things called junior piston cores, which are just hollow PVC pipes, basically. And she would nail them into the bottom of the ocean and it would go down into the sediment and collect whatever sediment ended up in it. And then she'd pull it up. And then I would have to go through these scoops of sediment um, and take a little bit out at every centimeter and then sort these forams out. And these forams are smaller than sand. So I would have to look through a microscope and I'd have to pull them out of all the sediment, which included volcanic rock, um, any sort of fossils, other fossils that were sitting down there, sand, crystals, like all this crazy stuff. And I had to pull them out. Um, and I think out of one scoop, which was roughly one by one centimeters, um, I pulled 500 forams out, which is crazy and took me a really long time to do because it is very tedious considering how small they are and you have to sit with a little brush looking through a microscope, which is not easy with glasses, um, and pull them out with the brush and hope that they don't go flying because they're also really light. And so touching them incorrectly and losing any surface tension, they will just bounce like popcorn everywhere and then they're lost forever because they're so tiny. Um, so that's what I did for all four years. And then towards the end of school, um, I started working with this woman named Dr. Brooke Fomang at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And she does morphology, um, which is basically like form and function of an animal's body and biomechanics and robotics. So she makes these bio-inspired robotics where she looks at an animal and then creates a robot based on that animal, um, which is super cool. And I thought it was really awesome. And so basically I approached her at a seminar and I was like, hey, your research is super cool. Can I work for you? <laughs> um, and she was like, sure, you're psyched about it. Sounds good. So I worked for her the last year and a half of my undergrad. Um, one of the things that I did for her was looked at remoras, which if you see pictures of sharks, there's always these little fish that are sticking to them and the top of their head is flat and it's a modified dorsal fin. So on sharks, they have the top dorsal fin and instead remoras have this flat disc, um, but they use that disc to suck onto them. And so these remoras have been seen sticking onto things like marlin that can go up to 60 miles per hour 
and be fine. Like they don't experience drag in the way that you would expect them to. Um, yeah, they're crazy. And so I made 3D models um, using this thing called Mimics Innovation Suite, which basically you take a CT scan, um, which is the same way you take a human CT scan where it takes slices, um, x-ray slices that you can split up and look at individually. Um, it puts them into this program and then you can remove and segment out what you want. And then you can do things like 3D print them. Um, you can compare them. And so what I did was I compared all of the different um, remoras to see like what was different about them um, and to look at their internal body because they're super weird to look at. And they have this hilarious underbite that if you look at them up close, their mouth, the bottom jaw is just like way out <laughs> in front of the top jaw. Um, and then I also went with her to Thailand and we worked on this species, which is this bottom picture right here called Cryptotor thamicola. Um, it is a blind cave fish. This picture is zoomed in a ton. Um, they're probably like maybe the size of my glasses frame. They are not large. Um, and they live in caves in Thailand. And basically what they do is they walk up waterfalls deep inside these caves. And that is what they spend their life doing. But the super cool thing about them is that they walk with a tetrapod-like gait, which basically means that the attachment of their pectoral fins to the rest of their body is similar to what tetrapods have. And they are the only known fish that we know of that has this attachment. And so we went to film them walking. Um, and then we brought all that film back to the lab and broke it down so we could see how they were doing it, the way that their different muscles and ligaments um, and structures moved in their body. And that was super awesome. Um, and that's the longest field experience that I've been on. I went for 10 days at the beginning of 2020 before COVID hit. So I had a great start to 2020 and then we all had a terrible rest of 2020. <laughs> at least you got in there a little, hey, we have a quick question. Yeah. Um, as far as your first job in university, you know, it sounds pretty tedious that work with the microscope and everything. So what, what made you stick with that tedious work? I mean, what, what kind of kept you going besides yeah. the paycheck probably? <laughs> Yeah, so um, it was a, it was part I did get paid for it, which was really nice. It was not a lot of money, though. Um, the biggest thing for me was that if you want to do any sort of science field, having experience is really important. And it does not matter what that experience is. And I stuck with it because, for example, she wrote me letters of recommendation from my freshman year of college all the way through when I applied to grad school. Um, she probably wrote me like 10 or 15 recommendations over the period of four years, which is a lot. Um, she helped, helped me meet Brooke, which is really important for networking, because if you don't meet people who will help you network, it's very hard to find the area you want to work in, the people you want to work for. And so I stuck with it, one, because I do find it interesting, even though it is not something that I wanted to continue doing, but also just because if someone offers you an experience and it does not matter if it's what you want to do you should take it and even if you only do it for a semester you're still getting valuable skills out of that for example i am really good at organizing like really good at organizing and that is definitely something that you can put on a resume um, and that people will find useful or for example i know how to manage a lab because she would be gone for six months collecting samples and i would continue all of her research for her while she was gone um, so there even though it's not what i'm doing now I learned a ton of skills from it that absolutely apply across any field. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. Okay, let's talk about sharks. So this slide is all about shark fishing. Um, so all of this is done under the necessary permits and tons of research has been done on things like the best way to catch sharks, the correct hooks to use, um, how to do a workup on them. All of this is heavily studied because in the end, the biggest priority is that the shark is fine. Um, and we do not want to be treating it inhumanely. And we also don't want to be hurting it or doing anything unnecessary to stress it out. So the two methods that I am most used to for fishing for sharks are drum lines and long lines. And basically a drum line is, um, let's see, this top middle picture, and then the picture right below it with all those lines on the deck. Um, basically there's a drum, which is a weight, and attached to the drum is this very long line of monofilament, which you can see in the top left corner. Um, there's bait on the bottom of it, and we use circle hooks. So a normal hook is a J hook, and it's literally just a J. A circle hook, the hook loops in, back inside. So if something swallows it, if a shark swallows it, for example, it doesn't get stuck inside their body. It can just sit there um, and not cause any harm to them. 
And so all of that monofilament, I think there's probably like 100 feet of it, is attached to this weight that then sits at the bottom of the ocean. So you can do this in 10 feet of water, and all you have to do is pull up the line, pull up the drum 10 feet, or I've done it in 80 feet. And then you have to pull up this 40 pound weight with all of this line up, you know, 60 or 70 feet, which is super tiring because one, you're doing it against water and you're also doing it against gravity and it gets really tiring. Um, but the purpose of something like this is you can actually catch really large sharks because you can put really big bait on it. Um, and the monofilament is important because if you catch a shark that is an obligate ram ventilator, which means they have to be swimming to get oxygen and water over their gills, they need to have a large radius to swim around in so that they can keep breathing. Um, if you catch something like a nurse shark, nurse sharks are not obligate ram ventilators. They actually do something called buccal pumping, um, which is all this crazy pressure stuff in their mouth. But basically, they can suck water into their mouth and then flush it out back over their gills. So they'll just sit on the ocean floor doing that all day. Um, and their jaw force is one of the craziest forces in the ocean for sure. Um, they can crunch crabs. They can crunch. So they're. Long lining, which is a very long, somewhat thin line that you attach a bunch of different hooks to. Um, people see this a lot in things like commercial fishing, because basically you can have ones that sit on the bottom or you can have ones that sit on the top and a hook hangs down from it. It's probably like four or five feet worth of hook. Um, and then there's a bait at the end. And what we do is we have 22 hooks all on this one super long line. Um, and basically that will sit in the water. And if a shark bites onto it, they still have a swimming radius, but it's not as large. And so we do things like checking it every hour instead of giving it a longer soak time, for example, because then the sharks don't get tired. They don't get as stressed out and we can get them back into the ocean as fast as possible. Um, anything else on this slide? So I have a question about shark fishing. Yeah. What method were they using in Jaws? <laughs> oh my gosh, I haven't watched that movie in so long. It's a pretty funny movie. I it's don't remember. <laughs> it's I okay, but I bet like you watching it now. I bet going back and watching it now, you'd be like, oh, this is all wrong, right? I'm oh, sure well, it's full of. There's so of many issues with that. Movie. Yeah. Like so many. <laughs> um, there's, all right, yeah. I was just curious. <laughs> Well, funny thing with Jaws is that the beach that my mom grew up by is the same beach that they filmed it at. And so when it came out for that summer, she like didn't want to go in the ocean because everybody was terrified when that movie came out. <laughs> I bet. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this bottom right picture, when we do long lines, we set them off the back of the boat. But when we haul them, we take them in from the front. And so we have this shark leash, which sounds super funny, but basically... The thing in my hand is the monofilament and at the bottom there's a shark and you attach it to this float so that if for some reason you drop it, it will float and you can go get the shark so they aren't swimming around with this fishing equipment on them. But you literally walk them down the side of the boat to the back of the boat. And that's just one of my favorite pictures because it's like, yeah, I'm taking a shark for a walk and not a dog. And it's cooler in my opinion. <laughs> uh, all right. So working of a shark. So we do five measurements when it comes to working up a shark. Um, we do length measurements. So we'll do a total length, which is from the tip of their nose all the way to the end of their tail. We'll do a pre-caudal length. Um, so on things like great white sharks, it's super easy to see this, but the pre-caudal length is right at the caudal keel, which is where the end of the body meets the tail. And then we'll also take a fork length. So the fork in their tail, this like middle section. And then we take a girth length, which is from one pectoral fin to the other. Um, so those are the measurements with a measuring tape that we take. And then we also take a super little tiny fin clip off the back of their dorsal fin. Um, we also take a very small muscle sample from the side of their dorsal fin. Um, we put a tag in. So the tags are used for seeing where the sharks are going, what they're doing, um, IDing them if someone finds them. Um, and you can retake all those measurements and compare them across each other. And then we also take a blood sample at the beginning of the workup and after. So at the start of a workup, if you get a shark that is large enough, there is this platform that goes off the back of the boat and it sits basically at water level. Um, and then in this shark, this is a, I think this is a black tip shark. Yeah, this is a black tip shark, a very large one. Um, this little pipe, you can kind of see it, it goes into its mouth and basically that pipe is attached to the bottom of the boat 
and it sucks seawater into it and then into their mouth so it's going over their gills so that they're constantly getting a push of water over their gills and sometimes especially if we catch something like a lemon shark when you try to pull the pvc pipe out they'll just chomp on it and like won't want to let it go and you're like dude i just want to put you back in the ocean they're like no i'm keeping this pipe for life um and it's really hard to get it back out of their mouth but the whole purpose of it is that we want them to be able to keep breathing um, while we're doing the workup and usually depending on the size of the shark they can, there can be one to like five people holding and restraining the shark so in this picture there's only two of us um, there's my friend nick at the head and he's holding right behind the jaws so sharks are cartilaginous and their jaws are very hard um, and pretty easy to find especially on something like a black tip or a tiger shark um, nurse sharks are a little bit harder you kind of just have to push their head down <laughs> um, and then i'm holding the tail back here and basically the whole purpose of this is just to make sure that the shark doesn't start writhing around so while we're doing this we're safe but also to make sure that the shark is safe and doesn't like go around hitting its head or swim away with a hook in its mouth um, so the measurements that we'll take these are all pictures these two pictures are examples of the tag so right underneath the dorsal fin there is this fleshy area we kind of call it like an armpit um, and basically you stick the tag in there you stick it in you kind of twist it around and you pull it out and what you're left with is this bottom picture where you can see the tag coming out and on that little yellow there's an id number and so if we put the shark back in and someone two weeks later catches it again they can have the tag number they can look up who originally tagged it and then they can give us whatever measurements they've received um, and then you can compare things like if they've grown um, if their muscle sample is different all the, their blood for example there's tons of thing, different things that you can look at which is super cool um, this top right picture is the fin clip and so this does not cause any pain to the shark one of the biggest things that we do as humans is we apply our own personal experiences to non-human things and tons of research has been done on the fact that sharks do feel pain but they don't feel it in the same way that we do so when we do these things like putting the tag in taking a fin clip taking a muscle sample they don't even flinch like there is no sign that they are experiencing what we would experience um, their nerves are completely different than ours and are not all over the body. They're in specific places. Um, and they also don't have the same pain receptors as us. So they don't learn from pain. So we like if we touch a hot stove, we're like, oh, I'm not going to do that again. A shark could bite a hook 80 times and won't learn that it should not bite a hook again. Um, so that's the fin clip. And then the bottom picture is an example of taking a measurement. So this is my friend Taylor taking a precaudal measurement. Um, and then this bottom picture is a little tiny bonnet head. They're so cute. Um, and Jake is taking a blood sample. So sometimes we will do in-water workups. And basically what we have is this bonnet head flipped upside down and then he's drawing blood. So I will explain blood in this next slide. Um, really quick, Amani, yeah. uh, um, we have a, a question and I think you're gonna get to this. So if you wanna put a hold on it, um, mm -hmm. it's actually about if you've ever swam with sharks. So I think oh. you're gonna talk about that in a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. I'll talk about that on okay, my last cool. slide. I yeah. just want to make sure. <laughs> um, okay, so this is an example of drawing blood. So basically, there's multiple ways to draw blood from sharks. Generally speaking, people do them um, from behind the backbone. So you'll lift the shark's tail up. You want them to be their body to be as straight as possible. And you go up. So like if my hand is the tail, you go up 90 degrees to their backbone. And then you pull off slightly because running along that black bone is a backbone is a vein. Um, and it can be really hard to draw blood sometimes. Sometimes they don't want to give it to you. But the purpose of it is you can see how their stress response is. So when sharks get stressed out, they secrete lactic acid. We do the same thing when we work out. When you get like a muscle pump, there's lactic acid in your blood, in your muscles more than there would be if you weren't working out. Um, and for us, we have really large hearts that pump all of our blood for us. Sharks have very small hearts in comparison to their body size and their tail actually helps a lot with the pumping of blood but if they secrete too much lactic acid because they're that stressed out they can actually die because they essentially poison themselves and they can't pump enough of that lactic acid out of their blood and so we take a measurement right before the workup so like as soon as the shark is on the platform we'll take one and then we'll take one at the end because then you can compare stress physiology things um, and because we do this we know that for example great hammerheads get really stressed out and your workup needs to be under two minutes for it to be like a completely safe workup for them. Um, and if you don't do that, they can absolutely die and get too stressed out. And so 
papers like that come out and then we know that we need to adapt what we're doing. Um, you know that you need to do a hammerhead workup as fast as possible. And if you don't get all the measurements, then that's too bad because you want the shark to get back in the water. And then these three pictures are releasing. Um, releases are super cool because a lot of times the shark will swim off and they'll literally just like, see ya, like they want nothing to do with us. It's not like they're turning around trying to bite us. They literally just don't want to be here. Um, but for example, this middle picture is a nurse shark release. Nurse sharks have really long back tails and I have been slapped in the face by a nurse shark tail on release because they will go to swim away and the tail will just go whack <laughs> right across your face and then they'll leave. And it's kind of just like a little, see ya, I don't want to be around you anymore. Here's a little slap to the face. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's releases are awesome because you just feel great after one because you've got all these measurements and you've done the research that you want to do, but also when the releases go really well, you're like, yes, the shark is fine. Like it's going off. It's not going to see us again, hopefully for a while. Um, and then this bottom picture I included because this is a great hammerhead re uh, release and great hammerheads have really tall dorsal fins, which you can see in this. They are known to have really tall dorsal fins. And when you get one on a line, sharks will act different um, depending on what kind of shark they are. For example, nurse sharks do what we call death rolls, which is you're pulling them up on the line and they're just like spinning their body in a circle. <laughs> um, and when you get them on the platform, they'll keep doing the same thing until you get them down. Great hammerheads, when they're caught, instead of sitting in the water column, they come straight up to the surface and do all these crazy sharp turns. And so it's a dead giveaway when you have a hammerhead because you see this massive dorsal fin come up. Um, they're also just amazing sharks to be near. I think the, log the largest shark I've been around has been a great hammerhead and it was 11 and a half feet, which is a very large shark. That is twice my size. <laughs> uh, and then these are just some of the sharks that I've met. So this top left photo is a juvenile hammerhead. Um, he is very small, but he will get very large. <laughs> Um, this middle picture is a baby nurse shark, and this top right and bottom left picture is a sandbar shark, and that's actually the first shark that I drew blood on, which is a special place in my heart for the sandbar sharks because that was a crazy experience for me. Um, and then this middle picture is a black tip shark, and then the bottom one is a bonnet head. The bonnet heads are so cute. They're named because their heads look like a bonnet. I also call them the shovels of the ocean because their head actually looks like a shovel. Um, they are related to great hammerheads, but instead of having like a long cephalofoil, it kind of looks like this. The cephalofoil is the scientific word for the hammer part of a hammerhead. Um, and this little bonnet head is the smallest bonnet head that I've ever seen. I think it was maybe like a little over a, a foot and a half. Like it was very tiny. Um, probably the tiniest shark ever that I've seen. Um, but bonnet heads have a special place in my heart because they're so cute. Uh, and I think that's it. Yeah. So if you want, to see any of my how it pants, for example, this is my Instagram and my Twitter. Um, and if you want to learn more about minorities and shark sciences, this is our website. The end. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there are some questions. So, so let's yeah. maybe you can tell us about your first time that you did swim with sharks. Yeah. Um, and then was there ever a time that you've been scared around a shark? Yeah. Okay. So um, the first time I swam with sharks was in Fiji in that picture. Um, and that I was not remotely scared because the biggest thing with sharks is movies like Jaws, for example, make it seem like sharks are like super curious about us and like want to eat us. Um, generally speaking, almost all of the shark attacks that we hear of are from people stepping on sharks, for example, walking around the ocean and stepping on them, um, harassing them, getting too close to them, following them around. Um, or the shark just like taking a small bite out of them, which we don't like, obviously, but we have our hands to feel things. Sharks do not have hands, they have their mouth. And so they will take a little nibble and be like, oh, what's that? Um, and there isn't actually any record of a shark eating a person. Um, that is something that does not happen. Um, if someone dies, for example, a lot of times it's because the shark hit an artery and our blood does not clot when we're in the water, it just keeps going. Um, and also because they have teeth and yeah, it's like if your dog bites you and you start bleeding, it sucks. <laughs> um, but they really don't want anything to do with us. There's all those like stats of like, you're more likely to die from a coconut hitting you in the head than getting bitten by a shark. And all of those are very true. They want nothing to do with us. <laughs> um, and then I don't think there's ever been a time that I've been scared of them. In my experience with them, you, you would respect a shark the same way that you would respect 
any sort of animal that could overpower you. Like there's a certain amount of respect that you have for your dog. You're not going to go around pulling their tail because they don't like that. You're not going to go around like swinging them around because that is not something that they would enjoy. And the same thing applies to sharks. Um, the way that we treat them is with an immense amount of respect. And we also are very well trained in how to be around a shark. Um, and so I don't, I would not say I've ever been afraid of one. Um, what's your favorite? Oh, well, I don't know if, if this little cute guy on the lower right hand corner is your favorite, but what's your favorite <laughs> shark? It's okay. I get asked this question all the time and I rotate between three sharks. So I'll just tell you all three. The first one is the great hammerhead. Um, because they are very dedicated to the fact that they like to eat rays, like stingrays, and they've been found with barbs all over their face. Barbs are the stingers on stingrays, and they actually will break off and get stuck in their mouth, and they still eat them. And I'm just like, dude, I get it. I have favorite snacks. I would probably still eat them, even if they kind of hurt me a little bit. Um, and then tiger sharks, one, because they look super cool, um, but also because they throw their stomach up when they get stressed out. And what I mean by this is they actually throw up their physical stomach. So when this happens, you can see this red glob come out of their mouth. And then what they do is they swim to get their stomach that's out here to go back into their body. And they like routinely do that when they don't want something in their stomach. They'll just throw the whole thing up and then jam it back in there. Um, and then, yes, bonnet heads because they're so cute. And also bonnet heads are the only omnivorous shark that we know of. So they eat crabs. They also eat grass, like seagrass, and they can actually take nutrients out of the seagrass. And we don't know of another shark that can do that. So they like salad with their dinner, and I have respect for that. <laughs> eat your veggies, kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so um, somebody is asking, what's a key skill and or personal characteristic one has to master in order to be a shark researcher? Oh, man. Okay, so... The thing with being a shark researcher is that there are many ways to be a shark researcher. For example, people would call me a shark researcher because I do field stuff with them. But I also know a social scientist who likes the human aspect of shark science, but people would also call her a shark scientist. So she looks at things like how fishermen interact with sharks, how the general population reacts to sharks. Um, she doesn't look at the sharks, she looks at the people, but she would still be categorized as a shark scientist. So in general, almost any skill would be good to have. Um, I, for example, field work comes very naturally to me. So being in the field, like common sense, thinking ahead, all that stuff comes natural to me. And so that helps me be really good in the field. Um, but also like things like having boat skills. If you have a captain's license, like one, you can get a job basically anywhere, um, especially if you are competent. Um, but also you can get yourself on shark research boats and learn how to be a shark scientist while also driving the boat. Um, being an enjoyable person, because if you're going to stand on a very small boat with someone all day, you want to be enjoyable. <laughs> you don't want to be stuck with someone who doesn't like to talk that much to everybody else um, or just says negative things all the time. Like just being able to generally find the positive things because field work does get hard. Um, we did a full day in pouring rain and I was shivering all day, but I was not complaining about it because I love sharks and it was really fun. But like, you have to be aware of the fact that it's not all shiny and crazy. Um, I've also not gone, like, the, you're not always in the Bahamas on some exactly. beautiful, you know, yeah. sunny day with warm yep. water. And I've also gone like four days in a row, not getting any sharks with over a hundred hooks in the water, like over those four days. Um, so being able to just keep a positive attitude, I would definitely say is really important. And then other things like, 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 hand, like just working and putting things together. Um, a lot of the equipment that scientists use are like basic house things that you would not expect them to be using. Um, but it comes in handy. And so like, if you know how to fix hooks or make super long lines and then add hooks at the end, that is super useful because not everybody knows how to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, basically any skill that you are good at will probably apply to something that could put you in shark science. <laughs> That's great. And you said too, that you, you know, you got a lot of experience, you know, in, in your earlier jobs that, that you use in your shark research all, all day long, right? Yep. Um, somebody asks, it, you know, says it's great to hear about your experiences, you know, traveling and with the ocean and um, that discovery when you were young. How do you think those experiences influenced your future? Um, 
I mean, I think like the ocean being a constant part of my childhood definitely just made it so that I liked the ocean. Um, one of my really good friends grew up in a landlocked state and like didn't see the ocean at all. Um, and she still became a shark scientist, but she had to like get around the fact that she wasn't next to the ocean all the time. Um, and so I think that like in general, my interest in the ocean was definitely hugely helpful, but also not every scientist is like, oh yeah, I love the ocean from when I was a child. Like some people will decide in college that they love the ocean or they love a certain species and then become a scientist. Like you can do whatever the heck you want. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then in general, like my parents always let me be curious about things. And so I think I was probably destined to go into science in some way. Like I wasn't going to go into business and sit behind a desk um, because my parents were always like, be curious about the world. And that's the thing that a scientist is literally just a large kid that is still curious about the world and wants to spend their life being curious. Um, yeah. So I, I would say those things are probably were cool. large influences. Yeah. I'm going to actually ask you to stop sharing your screen yep. so people can see your face more. Oh, yeah. Uh, great. We have some more questions coming in. So um, have you ever done any research on great whites? No, I have not. And is there a reason you just haven't had the chance or um, just not? I'm going to be them? honest. I think they're boring. I, I mean, great white sharks are the shark that you think of as a kid. And you're like, oh, that's a shark. Like, that is what a shark is. Um, but there's other things that are similar to great white sharks. For example, poor beagle sharks and salmon sharks are like miniature great white sharks, but they can do things like control their own internal body temperature and swim between these insane temperature gradients, um, which I think is super cool. And great white sharks can't do that. Great white sharks are stuck in water where they can be the temperature of the outside water and they can't control their internal temperature. Um, and I also just think there's so many cooler sharks <laughs> than great white sharks. <laughs> How many shark species are there? I think at this point there's like over 400. There's a lot <laughs> and they're really cool. And like all of, there's like big sharks that people pay attention to, like the great hammerhead and the tiger shark and the great white shark. But then people don't talk about like the mako shark, which is the fastest fish in the ocean. Um, they can swim unbelievably fast at crazy speeds. There's amazing footage um, of a mako shark following a piece of bait and keeping up with this boat that's going like 70 miles per hour. It's crazy. Um, there's the dwarf lantern shark which is the smallest shark in the ocean like can fit in your hand um and they can use bioluminescence so they actually have light that comes off of them um someone recently discovered a skinless shark so it does not have skin um which is pretty weird because sharks one of the things that sharks share all of them with each other is their skin which is called dermal denticles um which is modified teeth so basically teeth evolved out of their mouth and grew down their body um, and so these little scales are actually covered in enamel, just like our teeth are, but they vary across species and also across a singular shark's body. And they're part of the reason that sharks can swim so smoothly in the ocean. Um, yeah. In so short, you're saying you're not scared of this large animal that's covered in teeth. Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty <Thanks>. cool. <laughs> um, what are some of the cons of your job or, you know, your experience, excuse me, um, so far? Um, Hmm. Are there any cons? Here's the thing. I love my job. Like, I really love my job. I would say that sorting through data is definitely not a highlight. <laughs> um, sitting in a chair looking at data is not enjoyable, but it is part of the job. Um, applying for grants is not the highlight of my life to get funding, but it's also part of the job. <laughs> um, but I would say, like, in the field, I haven't thought of any downsides I guess aside from when I forget to put sunscreen on and burn myself really badly <laughs> yes be careful wear a hat yes <laughs> um so somebody said Melinda asks it seems like you're taking samples from lots of sharks in general is the goal to collect data that will then be distributed or do you work with the data you collect and what is the goal of that research yeah so the projects that I've worked on um they're all, all of the measurements that we take can be used in like as one data set for, for example, for like a literature review of a species, which is basically just like one super long paper that has things like their biology, their physiology, what they eat, where they live, um, any sort of like fisheries interactions that they have. Or you can write things um, like comparing stress physiology. So comparing 
a great white hammerhead's lactate response to um, lactic acid response uh, to a sandbar shark or to a black tip shark. Um, and so all of those different samples can be used for a ton of dis different research. And the point of it is basically to better understand sharks. Um, shark science is a very, very broad field. I feel like most of the time people just see scientists like in the field looking at where they're going, what they're doing and like movement ecology like that. But people study things like their skin. Someone tried to make a swimsuit that was based on their skin because sharks are one of the smoothest um, fish in the ocean in terms of being able to move through water without things like drag. Um, people look at their teeth, people look at their evolutionary history, and then all of this research gets published in scientific papers. Um, and some of those things are like open access, which means that you can read them anytime that you want. And others will be published in journals where you have to either pay to look at them or if you're part of like an institution, then your school usually has a database and you can just download papers um, from there. But all of those papers are like for the point of people to read them. You know, scientists aren't just writing papers hoping nobody will read them. They want you to read them and they want you to be like, oh my gosh, sharks are cool. This is this crazy thing that I can do to help them or this is this new discovery that we've made. So are there things that we can do to help sharks? Oh yeah. I mean, shark things like shark conservation are a very complex topic and conservation in general is, so I won't go into it too much, but um, things like just protecting the ocean in general, reducing your own plastic use, um, trying to figure out um, alternatives to things like meat consumption, um, if you have that option. Um, one of the things that recently came out, I'm not going to go into detail about it because that's a whole other discussion, but the idea that one country is the issue for sharks dying, so like shark finning and blaming that all on one group of countries or one group of people is a very wrong take um, because they are not the only ones using shark. The U.S. fishes for shark, the U.S. sends fins out, imports and exports them. Um, we have products in our own home that have shark in them. And so when it comes to wanting to protect them, there are a lot of different things that you can do, but you have to make sure that you are considering the outside factors and what you can and can't do. For example, not everybody cannot eat fish because that can be a very expensive diet. Or if you live somewhere that doesn't have access to shipping ports and you fish for a living and that's what you eat, then it's not an option for you to just not eat fish. Um, and also just not eating fish is not how you save the ocean. But yeah, there's things like shark conservation. I would honestly recommend just reading articles from shark conservationists or just conservation scientists in general, because they dedicate their life to figuring out what we can do to be better for the planet, what we can do to be better to sharks and the ocean. Um, and they are not getting paid a lot for what they're doing. Like they are doing it because they want to and because they love it um yeah <laughs> cool um somebody asks what have uh, sorry have you ever worked and i'm gonna not say this right maybe but uh, an epaulette shark oh my gosh they're so cute <laughs> epaulette sharks no i haven't worked on them for those of you who don't know they're a species of walking shark and they walk in tide pools um and they're so cute <laughs> but no i haven't i hope one day that would be nice <laughs> That's great. So I would love to hear before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, if people have more questions, please shoot them over. Um, we are, I think we're gone through all the Q&A mostly. Um, but I am curious about your next steps. You know, you're applying for grad school. What is what does that look like? And how are you going to continue uh, on this pathway that you have? And what do you see yourself like in five years? Oh, man. Well, in five years, hopefully I'm graduating with a PhD. Um, yeah, so I just went through applying to grad school. Um, Basically, I kind of just decided what part of research I wanted to be in and then found people who were doing something similar to that. And so I'm currently choosing between two grad schools. Um, it would be for a PhD. So one of the things that people don't really know about science fields is that you don't have to get a master's to get a PhD. Um, I had a ton of experience in my undergrad. I'm going to have publishing experience by the time the year is over. Um, and so getting a master's was not something that I thought was worth it or worth the money. Um, and so I applied to do a PhD and hopefully for the PhD, I'll be looking at shark morphology, um, and biomechanics. So basically just like how their body interacts with their environment. Um, I'm super nerdy about shark skin. And so probably relating to shark skin because it's super cool. Um, 
So that's my next five years is like dying in graduate school, <laughs> writing a thesis dissertation and all of that stuff. Um, but in that time, I'm going to be doing a bunch of field work as part of my project, which I'm super excited about because I love field work. Um, and I think the overall end goal is just to have my own lab and be able to support other students who want to do shark science and like tell them all the things that I wish someone had told me and help them figure out where they fit in shark science. Um, and probably I'd probably do some like field stuff in between, maybe work in an aquarium. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully have some money so that you can hire a grant writer, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to do that. Um, and then before we wrap, I do want to give you some time to talk a little bit about MISS, because um, I think that's, uh, again, you know, community wise is uh, really about investing in programs and opportunities for women here in Sonoma County uh, or for girls to, to pursue STEM education and careers. And uh, the reason why we do this work, it really is because we believe in the value of diversifying the STEM workforce, um, you know, in terms of you know, not just to have access for people to have access to the STEM world, but also uh, to, it really helps us progress and come up with new ideas and use different types of brains and, you know, all the, the diversity in having a, a, a really blended STEM workforce is important for, for advancement. And so I would love to hear more about what uh, Minorities in Shark Sciences is and, and what your goals are with that organization. Yeah, totally love talking about MISS. Um, so basically, we established MISS back in June of 2020. Um, I co-founded it with three other Black female shark scientists. Uh, and basically what happened was we all found each other under a hashtag on Twitter, and we were like, oh my gosh, there's more of us? There's like more Black women in shark science? This is crazy. Um, and so we kind of joked about like, well, what if we made a club for women of color to, who like want to be in shark science? And then we were like, let's just do it. Let's actually just make a club. Um, and so it's called Minorities in Shark Sciences. Um, and it is basically to help women of color get into shark science to create a welcoming space for them in shark science, um, because it is a historically male and white dominated field. Um, and also to break financial barriers down into shark science, because marine science as a whole is very expensive to get into. You don't get a lot of money once you're done. <laughs> Um, and a lot of times things like internships will be unpaid or they'll ask you to pay to go get this experience. And if you don't come from a background where you can afford to do that, then it's not really a field that you can go into. Um, and so that is our overarching goal. We have over 250 members now um, from, I think, 18 different countries, which is super cool. And they range from high schoolers all the way to PhD students to professors. Um, we open membership starting from ninth grade. Um, and we do a bunch of different things with our members. We'll do networking um, events. We've done like grad school talks, resume building. Um, I think for high schoolers in the future, we'll probably do like an uh, applying to college, like marine science college, like colleges that have marine science programs, um, how to get into labs and things like that. And then we also provide funding for people to do internships um, for internships that you would normally have to pay for. So two of the ones that we're doing this summer um, are at Bimini Shark Lab in the Bahamas, which is a very famous shark lab. Um, but you do have to pay to go. And so we are funding two people um, going to Bimini Shark Lab and spending two months with them, helping them with their research there. And then we are also sending four people. <laughs> I had to think about that. We're sending four people to Ocean's um, Research Institute in South Africa to help them with their white shark research. Um, and That's great. The, yeah, and like the points of these were that they don't have to take money out of their own bank accounts um, or to give them opportunities to do them um, that they, where they wouldn't normally apply. Um, and then the other two things that we did that we just finished at the end of a uh, March and beginning of April, we did two workshops and we had 10 women of color come out on a boat with us and do a weekend of shark research with us. And they also did not have to pay for that. And the point of those were to have people come out who don't have any research experience um, and to give them like a sneak peek into shark research. And we did a bunch of different things. We did like a grad school talk. We did a what is shark science talk. Um, we did all these different like uh, interactive talks basically with them. And it was super great. fun and they were all amazing and I can't wait to do it again next year. Hey, that sounds really great. And you're already yeah. making such a big impact in just a year. That's wonderful. Yeah, we've done a lot in a year and I am very excited to see where we go with it. 
Yeah, that's fabulous. And I love hearing about that career exploration, you know, getting people out and just giving them a taste. Uh, that's definitely yeah. what, you know, that's really kind of the work that is behind our mission as well. So, yeah. well, great. Thank you so much, Amani. I don't see any other questions. Um, so if there's anything else that you want to share, you can. Otherwise, I really appreciate you jumping on with us today. And, um, you know, I hope you have a great 2021 and, uh, uh, you know, fun making a decision about your next uh, oh, yes. <laughs> several years at grad school. So good luck with that. Thank you so much for having me. I okay. love talking about sharks. So to anybody who will listen. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Great. I'm just going to share really quickly. Um, uh, so you can, uh, I'm just going to show our next, um, next sessions coming up so people can see. And um, again, thank you so much for being here and we'll talk to you soon. I think I might be still pinned, so I'm not sure if they can Oh, are you? It. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's remove you. <clears throat> and I'll share again, just in case. Uh, we have a couple more STEMspiration series coming up in May. Uh, so uh, we've got a May 6th panel discussion with a couple engineers and a geologist from the California Water Board. And then we have... Um, Alyssa Eckert, who is the medical illustrator for the Centers for Disease Control, who was integral in creating the coronavirus illustration that we are all so familiar with. So anyway, thank you again, Amani, and everybody have a great evening and we'll talk to you soon.